And here we are at the convergence, and uh, we've got the uh, not so great Britain and uh, Canada, Quebec colony uh, uh, converging here, and uh, we have a lot to say about about Palestine, about England, Swingland, the Angles, and the Labour Party. So you know the Labour Party puts on a good show, you know, but. <laughs> There's a problem with the Labour Party because it is an uh, alliance with uh, a fascist regime in Palestine called the Israeli government. And yet they don't seem to be aware of this. How come? How come Labour Party doesn't know that it's supporting a, bunch, a gang of fascists, basically? Well, you see, the, um, the super revolutionary and not reactionary at all in any way this statement was sponsored by Keir Starmer. Labour Party um, was uh, <laughs> would obviously cause no harm. Would never willingly support a country that's like been on the TV for like months and months and months to the point you might as well say almost a year. Um, genocide. They, they wouldn't go and get elected after all the knowledge has been put out there and go. There are guys. Uh, mm, Tony mm. Blair, he's a fucker. But yeah, um, what's it? Uh, no, what the Labour Party is is the fucking the bunch of fucking fascist little sleaze bags. Um, it's hard to even say they offer a social fascist option. What they want to privatize the NHS more to help with the waiting list problem that privatizing the NHS has caused. Mm. Wonderful. They, they want to, like, target trans people, including targeting us on the wards and hospitals and all sorts of trying to do segregation policies. And so Labour's showing themselves how fascist they are. And again, in, with Palestine, their reaction to, um, you know, they, all their crit they criticize the Tories for um, bad lines, even though they unequivocally supported Palestine themselves, too. So they're like, sorry, Israel, fucking autism, uh, supported Isra uh, Israel, too. When uh, Rishi said that was going on, it was actually uh, seen as a point of like unification between the two men. The, um, the big Israeli fanboys like to get the, the sauce and the gravy all over their sticky hands. But like um, fucking so Labour comes in and they backtrack on their promise to withdraw the objection in the ICC. Labour said that they would withdraw the inject, uh, um, objection for the ICC to do an investigation and arrest anyone who needs to be arrested. Um, you know, so they've, 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 they've now backtracked on that. They're not going to withdraw anymore. And um, Bloody Lammy goes on a visit to Israel. Um, he's got some good sounding talking points if you're like a know nothing liberal and you got like, you know, your ear to the ground on like uh, you know um sorry you got your head under the ground when it comes to like shit going on but like you know he does say that like illegal settlements should fuck off and other you know that they shouldn't be allowed and stuff like that and it's like okay sounds good dig deeper well there was a massacre like a day before he turned up mm. and the motherfucker didn't say a thing he mm. can go on about how much that like he thinks there shouldn't be Israeli illegal settlements mm. and any new illegal settlements shouldn't be made. He doesn't say anything about getting rid of the old ones, which is like mm. a bit of an interesting thing, <laughs> um, a bit of show of hand. But he also shook hands with like fucking a guy committing a genocide right now. Mm. Like, you know, for all of the position that I've pointed of like, you know, sometimes you do have to shake the hands of some pretty bad people as a point of meeting and all that. At the end of the day, no one should even be wanting to fucking meet with BB unless it's to shut down the war. If there's another option that doesn't involve kicking that man into the grave, but really that motherfucker needs arresting, not fucking diplomatizing with the yes. ICC mm -hmm. should be allowed to go in and arrest the entire fucking cabinet. And mm. like the entire leadership of that Gates guys party, um, uh, the the defense minister, the guy who runs that fucking nationalist party. Yeah, I can show you the uh, photo that you're referring to, in which uh, oh, boy. 
boy, I forget where it is now. I got too many windows open here. <laughs> I think it's here. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Look at this. And Netanyahu is real happy, you know, very happy to have his hand. I mean, he looks like he almost knows that he's like fucking made like political suicide. Like this, the, the like the looking away and the almost straight face on Lammy is just like, yes. I'm signing away my time <laughs> in government. Soul, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, this is, you know, obviously a supporter uh, of the Zionist state. You know, he's a Zionist. Okay. That's British right. Zionist, British state Zionist, speaking on behalf of the British state. And what does he have to say to get, you know, you know, collect a bit of credibility after such a debacle? David Lammy has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza during his first visit to Israel and the Palestinian territories as foreign secretary. Oh, okay. Smart man. <laughs> he has to be. He has to be, you know, in order to survive. Okay, he has to play both sides. Yeah, both sides of the game. Okay. But, so, um, but, but, but the goal to go into the, the, the land of the holy Israel and to tell them that they should have a ceasefire. Oh, the gall on him. Does he not know he's being anti-Semitic? Is he not no, aware he of? Yeah, well, you know, like th that'll follow <laughs> afterwards. You know, anybody else who says the same as him, you know, is going to be denounced. You know, but he gets away you know, with it. You know, because they have no choice. God, the fact that the police in America were with sniper rifles ready to shoot children, uh, like they were, well, college kids, like adults, young adults, stuff like that, you yeah. know, trying to fucking shoot young adults because they were protesting what? Yeah. They, they called for a ceasefire. <laughs> it, was, it was written on like big banners on them. These are like, well, like 18 year olds to like 20 three or 24 year olds like that's like university college age like and yes. so and this is in england they're like this was in america um, oh, in america, the american yeah. police yeah. yeah they they got snipers set up and set them up at like fucking like yeah. several different points to aim at the the protesters yeah if anybody sort of touched a cop <laughs> Or something like that, yeah. And they're probably just looking for any black people they could target. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I need a puffer as well as you do. Yeah, I just know I'm just sort of riffing on like because American police officers they just got this like unbridled will to shoot people the moment that they are darker than a fucking like certain certain color set. Um, Incredible, yeah. It's like it's like. And, and it's that colorism again with how like um, modern racism has been like molded into because colorism is actually an incredibly modern way of doing racism. Um, the white and black shit has existed for even longer than colorism. Like colorism kind of took the white and black stuff and made it more about like your actual complexion rather than like the weird uh, Abrahamic faith. Purity, impurity, which I'm pretty sure they just got that from the Greeks. Uh, Originality. <laughs> oh, yeah, purity, yeah, well. Because <laughs> Greece had, like, me, a yeah. massive purity fetish. It was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. This reminds me of uh, the statue of uh, Michelangelo. Uh, no, the statue of David by Michelangelo. Okay. So one of the sponsors of the statue, you know, which is very enormous and very costly. So one of the sponsors comes by and says to Michelangelo, you know, like... You know, could you make a, a a minor adjustment there, you know, and shave off the end of his nose, you know? Why? Because he looked too Jewish, you know, like, even though it's David, you know, it's nonetheless, you know, it's a statue in Europe, you know, it can't this look Jewish too Jewish. guy in history looked too Jewish. You need he to look too, it. He looked too Jewish, you know, like his, his circumcised, you know, penis, that's okay, you know, because it was small enough, you know, it wasn't really... All that visible, but <laughs> the nose, you know, like that's really visible, you know, like, okay. So what happens, you know, like this nose here, you know, this little bit, this little, little bit here, you know, like a skin right there, you know? Okay. So, but you know, I'm, I'm a bit bigger than uh, the statue of David, you know? So he was already, you know, like down to the minimum there, you know, like Michelangelo knew what he was doing, you know, he's down to the minimum. 
So what he does is, you know, he goes into this workshop and collects, you know, a few particles and dust, you know, of of uh, marble that had, you know, come off before. Conceals it, you know, climbs up on the scaffold, you know, goes over there, you know, and makes, you know, some sort of sounds, you know, and, you know, covers over the nose while he's working and lets the little particles drop down on the floor beneath, you know, where the sponsor is standing watching. <laughs> So then, you know, like he quits the work, you know, after a couple of hours, you know, and he says, okay, it's done. And then the sponsor says, oh, yeah, okay, thank you. You know, that's great. You know, <laughs> it gets into that shit about how, like, the whole nose thing is just so overblown. People go out looking for something that isn't even that easy to fucking find. Yeah, like, well, you know, like the skin I mean, isn't dark enough. You got to find something, you know, like. <laughs> It's, 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 it's uh, just biological determinism. That's what it is. Racism is biological determinism. Well, they they do it. Well, well, well. Racism is a, like got all sorts of different mixtures in it because of its weird sociological like existence. Because like God, when, when it's going biology, when it comes to the Irish in the the Scots Gaelish, um, it'll be ginger. That'll be the thing that they'll go for. But you also usually have the way we sound. So they 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 had us right at the culture, um, and it still happens today. Not only with us back home in Ireland, and obviously with the Scots Gaelish too, but also with the um, uh, the Scousers in Liverpool, and the and it happens with the Cymraeg too, um, uh, where like you know our ways of just communicating are points of laughter for the British. Things to get excited over and take the piss out of and fucking then make up loads of stupid shit. Like, if anyone wants to definitely not get the shit beaten out of them within five minutes of landing in Ireland, you should say top of the morning to you. It's definitely not, like, going to just get you absolutely levered the shit out of, I promise. That's the same thing happens to... <laughs> same thing happens to uh, uh, the men from France who come here, you know, and they take a job away from a Quebecois guy, you know, because they got more qualifications because in France, you know, universities are free. So there's a lot of highly qualified, you know, people in France, you know, with no job. And they come to Montreal here, you know, to get a job. And then they think that they're, you know, like owning the place, you know, that this is a French colonial sort of enterprise or something like that. And they usually get taken care of within a month of arriving here. Same thing. I've heard many such stories. Hmm. But yeah. Uh, about Lamy, the foreign secretary now of the not so great Britain, he not to also be confused of Lemmy Kilmeister, the late frontman of Motorhead. <laughs> I don't know Motorhead. Um, Lemmy Kilmeister, the late frontman of Motorhead. M Motorhead. That's you don't a band. know Motorhead. That's a band. I don't a heavy know metal that. band. Oh, and he shares the name with one of the musicians in that ground in that group. Um, what's it? No, Lammy and Lammy sound the same. So I was like, Lemmy Kilmeister, you know, not to be confused with. Okay, irrelevant. Okay, nonetheless. Okay, so he gets up in the House of Commons, you know, and there's the International Court of Justice decision declaring the occupation to be an occupation. And what is he going to do? You know, like he has to go along with international law. Because uh, Britain is supposed to be, you know, like um, hoity-toity on international law. So he actually does make a statement saying that the occupation is illegal and settlements are, or the illegal settlements have to go. What you define as an illegal settlement, of course, is determined by what the Zionist government says is an illegal settlement. You know, and one of the first settlements, Kadunum, outside of the Nablus, you know, it was declared to be an illegal settlement, you know, by the cabinet at the time. And it's still there and it's expanded and it keeps on eating up the lands, you know, of three Palestinian villages. Kud Kudumim, it's called. But and they said where... it was illegal. So it means the state definitely doesn't support it at all. And that's why that's they right. definitely don't do with, send them resources the all the time. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not <laughs> about the state, you know, it's just the state of its own, something like that. But then they send them resources all the time and it's like, Oh yeah, subsidies and 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 you know military production and uh, electricity and gas pipes and uh, 
and uh, roads, you know, like roads too, you know, well kept roads and all that sort of shit. Um, motorways that chop up or Palestinian roads and make it impossible for Palestinians to get anywhere. It's made like what would be forty minute drives turn into three hour drives. Yeah, that happens at the Kufr Gadum. That's the village that I went to demonstrate at. You know, if they're not allowed to go down their village road down to the highway, they have to go all, all the way through back roads. You know, it takes three times as long. You know, to get to a hospital. That sort of thing, yeah. For sure that's happening still. Uh -huh. A lot of people and ended up said, dead the moment the, they got to the hospital because of shit like yeah. this. Because then the checkpoints get you and the checkpoints will hold you yeah. for fucking two hours, especially oh, if they yes, know they can, you've got someone will, yeah. who needs to go to the Especially if they know you've got someone who needs to go to the hospital. Yeah, then that's they'll, the whole they'll, point. They'll purposely hold you up. Life in, in the West Bank unbearable so that the Palestinians will leave. But no country wants to let them in. You know, all of the Arab countries around there are saturated. Jordan has 2 million Palestinian refugees, uh, 1.5 million in uh, Iraq, I believe, another million or half million in Syria, another half million in Lebanon. Yeah. The yeah, diaspora makes up to 10 million if you like go outside of um, uh, West Asia. Yes, and 5.7 are registered with UNRWA as actually a you know, resident in a refugee camp. Yeah. That was yeah. the other thing as well. Like, why hasn't Lamy stood up for UNRWA? Like, because, like, basically, Britain backed Israel's uh, sabotage of UNRWA when they blamed them for uh, yeah. October the 7th. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, same thing happened in Canada. But Canada has reversed its position and is now funding UNRWA again. But the local Jewish member of parliament here, of the commons, who is the deputy in the riding at which I was protesting with the vigil of the Jewish Bund vigil at the Jewish community campus. He is opposed to renewing funding for UNRWA. He is supporting genocide in Gaza. And he's mouthing off and is given a special position to be a spokesperson for the Liberal Party. You know, alongside somebody else who's a spokesperson for the, for the Jewish interests uh, with respect to anti-Semitism. Now he's a spokesperson for the Liberal Party on Zionism, even though he's opposed to the Liberal Party position on Zionism. You know, supposedly. <laughs> okay. You know, like, so I just announced, I sent off, you know, a, a statement to all the Jewish media in the country saying that I'm going to run against this guy in the next election. It's going to be the Jewish blend against the Zionist parties. <laughs> Even if I'm in Palestine, I'll do it anyway, somehow. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell all the Jewish people, if you vote for me, I'll leave Palestine <laughs> and come back and be your deputy. <laughs> That'll get the Zionist vote. <laughs> <laughs> they'll just vote you to get rid of you <laughs> yeah and then you'll do like most politicians and not follow your campaign promises and stay in palestine anyway <laughs> could be could be <laughs> I, i've run in elections before against sinus you know i've run for the uh uh quebec solidaire party which is the so socialist party basically of uh United Front of leftists, revolutionary leftists, and Quebec uh, patriots. And uh, I've run for the predecessor of the Party of Democratic Socialism. In fact, I helped to create the uh, Quebec Solidaire Party when I proposed the uni unification of the Party of Democratic Socialism together with uh, 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 Option Citoyenne, which was the feminist political movement at the time. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, and it worked, you know. Now they got ten seats in the in the in the, in the Commons there, in the Parliament and uh, in the Legislature, provincial Legislature. It's called, but it's actually the National Assembly in Quebec. You know, it shows you know the sort of you know the the matter of British uh, colonialism. You know, because in English, the leading you know a legislative body in in the in Quebec region is called a, a provincial Legislature in English. But in French, it's the National Assembly. So it's, you know, national. It's, you know, like autonomous from the rest of Canada. But the rest of Canada doesn't even know that that's what it's called. <laughs> because on the news, they always get told, you know, a provincial legislator passed, you know, a motion, uh, you know, um, supporting a further autonomy. And that's the right wing uh, populist, uh, center right uh, populist and nationalist uh, government that uh, that exists now in Quebec. And uh you know, they're, the you know Canada has to provide them with certain concessions of, of autonomy, and there's this whole sort of you know like Council of the Federation, which is being set up, which is another legislative body now, which is being created by the force of each 
of the former provinces now demanding a say in various uh, areas that concern the immediate interests of the population, like health care and, uh, and pensions. So Quebec has its own health care and pensions, and, it's, and it took over its own blood uh, system, blood uh, transfusion system as well, after the Red Cross was found guilty of a contamination with the hepatitis C virus, which contaminated me. And I was dying slowly over 28 years with a, a life expectancy of 20 years. And because I, I finally got cured, you know, like I lasted long enough that I got a cure with interferon. I was one of the first people to be dosed with interferon. With, well, they, they didn't even know what the dose doses should be. And they gave me too much, you know, sent me into, you know, suicidal, suicidal train of thoughts. And 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 constant bodily, uh, muscular pain and rage, you know, spontaneous rage against my own son, even you know, during that you know interferon treatment, and I was cured finally, you know, on the second treatment because the first treatment, like, you know, was just too powerful and I couldn't last, and so we sued the government and I got two hundred and sixty thousand dollars, bought a house, okay. fixed it up myself because I know construction from my father. And sold it for double the price. And with that money, I'm going to go and uh, make a project in Palestine to set up a guest house for international volunteers so they don't have to pay for private hotel fees. Right? Good strategy, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to no, that. That's... I just have one knee left to do and then uh, go back, you know, to Palestine. Yeah. Well, something like that it can get people to actually start, like, getting involved more with like being involved with health in Palestine, people who could actually bring a lot of like power over. I don't think people understand that the dollar holds a lot of power in these places, like compared to like what Palestinians have to get out of like they don't know how little like you're making living inside the occupied like um territories like the 48 region. Yeah. Like you are making pittance if you're in the the authority you're not making all too much if you have to go work in israel mm -hmm. like yeah yeah well 160,000 uh, palestinians in the west bank are given permits to go and work as next to slave labor mm -hmm. inside 48 yeah. territories but they just have to get themselves unionized and go on a general strike when the when the pa says there's a general strike you know right now they just continue going to work you know at five o'clock in the morning and the white the problem come is, from, uh, it's like there's no organization of, around them. They're expected right. to organize themselves. And it's like, well, there does need to be an anti put up there. If you're all like hurdled like that, as essentially slave labor, you're going to be like pretty like well, like watched and like at gunpoint to a certain degree. Yeah. You've got, you know, like, like anybody who's organized. I've seen enough within, videos of like. Fired. Because they, they um, there's certain parts of Israel they're allowed to work in. It's not like they get to go work in all of Israel. There's certain parts yeah. of Israel where a lot of them are working. Unless, yeah. unless you're, um, you know, one of the more privileged like lot of the bunch. But if you're doing the slave labor, you're in the parts where there's soldiers everywhere. Because there's parts of Israel where you're not going to see people with assault rifles all the time. And mm. like, uh, yeah, you know, there are parts where that's what you see everywhere there ain't a street you don't see someone either parked on the street corner or patrol in the street path with yeah. a fucking um what's it an, uh, an israeli assault rifle i can't remember what assault rifles they use at the minute um uh, yeah uh, the american one the m16 do they use the m16 shit because they, yeah. they had their own rifles because they had like the, oh, the Uzi. It, like the... Yeah, but that's for assault, you know, it was these submachine guns. No, gun, no, yeah. I mean the um you've got like the M Tar and then like before then you had like the Galil. Um uh -huh. I think oh, those yeah, are specialized. The, yeah, ones. I'm pretty sure the TAR is is um their gun, because like I think it's well, I might be wrong. Got, it might be Turkish. I was but, detained um, by the soldiers, the ones that I got detained by. You know, there was three of them were women, one of whom was an Ethiopian woman. And they were already detaining me, you know, with their guns. And uh, <clears throat> and so I said to them, you know, uh, is that an M16 gun from the uh, United States? And she said, yeah, proudly. And so I said, well, you see, you're working for the United States, aren't you? <laughs> and she said, nothing. <laughs> and then another one said, you know, like, you're trespassing. I said, what do you mean trespassing? You know, the Palestinian village is just down there and they asked me to come up here. And they said, no, you're trespassing. 
And I tried to figure out what she was saying, you know, and then after a few minutes, you know, I figured it out. She thinks that land had been annexed by some, you know, Zionist, you know, colony, you know, like three hills over, you know, like you couldn't even see it. <laughs> and it was supposed to be, you know, like annexed to that village over there, you know, because she says so. So I said to her, you know, like, who do you think you are? You know, like even Netanyahu hasn't even been able to annex, you know, the Jordan Valley, you know, like he hasn't been able to get away with that stroke. It just wouldn't work. And so, you know, like the other two soldiers laughed at the first soldier, you know, because she was giving me a hard line, you know. <laughs> it was Get absolutely fucking schooled. <laughs> you know, like I play, you know, I, you know, like I, I, I really sort of, you know, deal with the soldiers in a Jewish way. And I try to oh. make them break, break down, you know, their, their military mentality and their, uh, you know, lack of thought, you know, lack of imagination in which they're instilled with. So, you know, I speak to them as a Jewish person, tell them that, you know, I don't like what you're doing. And, you know, like the reason is, you know, like, because you're not defending the Jewish people at all here. I said that to one Ethiopian guy, you know, he started listening. I was surprised. So I kept on talking until his officer ordered him to come back. <laughs> we were having good talk. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, there's as well, like something that, do you know what, out of all the places I first learned this, I learned this from the uh, Tom Baker, the fourth doctor. And it's something he says about why he doesn't like go around carrying weapons. And it has nothing to do with him not liking weapons. No, I'm not saying people don't carry weapons. It's just something I'm going to, I'll explain what I mean by what I'm getting into by this. And he goes on about how like, you know, if people perceive him as peaceful. They'll be more willing to talk to him than they are to just kill him. But what I'm taking from sort of this aspect, because he actually is a combatant. This doctor's used a gun. He's shot at people. But, um, you know, mm. uh, the thing is, is what he's trying to say is that, like, you know, so let's put this in perspective of reality. If you've been captured, no matter if you were armed or not, let's say you're an activist on the street, you've been captured. Rather than getting angry, you can have a lot of fun with these kinds of people by talking with them because they're like, fucking people who have this like big I am energy about them that they have to keep telling themselves so they don't get mm. fucking like completely psychologically jaded by the fucked up work they do and yeah. you know they're gonna get psychologically screwed up regardless killing people don't do well for pe people's minds neither does like yeah. terrorizing or torturing people so yeah. you just you kind of chip away at stuff you yeah. don't need to go straight for the finish line you just ask like so the Socratic method you mm. ask questions. Let mm. them do the talking. Everyone's yeah. got something that they'd really like to talk about. And so, uh, and sometimes you can just start with the mundane and then you can find a ticket like a US M16 assault rifle. A question that rather than being loaded, it just very tactfully slotted in the word US there rather than is that an M16 assault rifle? But yeah. the, specifically Americanizing the question so that then when you wanted to turn around and then ask, hmm. well, you work for America though, don't you? <laughs> it's already yeah, been. She speaks up. English it's... like an American, you know, she probably comes from New York. You know? And, but that's what the Houthis, you know, the Ansarala, you know, just sent that drone over from the sea, took the long way around and they got, near pretty close you know to the uh, american consulate in tel aviv and bombed it it was a big bomb you know like the video that i saw you know the the red ball you know like was pretty big there you know like bigger than than any you know like a apartment tower in the foreground incredible action and so israel has had to respond and they've blown up you know like oil reservoirs you know to make a big fuss looking you know like fire and uh they're proud you know that the pume of smoke coming out of that you know polluting the atmosphere is to be visible throughout the whole Middle East. This is what the Defense Minister Gallant, you know, was very proud of saying today on Al Jazeera. Like, so, <laughs> I cannot wait for that guy's spine to be scalpeled out of his fucking body, the fucking fascist piece of shit. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. some motherfucker needs to punch him so hard in the throat, he, like, wakes up and fucking, like... Narnia, Lion, the Witch, and the fucking Buzzsaw. Like, I just can't... I got so much rage for that motherfucker. Like, him and his fucking war minister, and um, the guy who's the... Um, uh, who's the guy who rules over the West Bank? Bing um, And the uh, National Guard. Yeah. Yeah. 
So like, you know, um, this is the situation that like we have here where these are being used as symbols of genocide. Like this would be like, like to show the insanity of this, it's like fucking like, um, you know, uh, like it would be like if Hitler was like openly touting about the death camps in the middle of the war, about the smoke pluming from the fucking tops yeah, of the factories so that open, he was telling yeah, like that it didn't he, exist. He's the one who's uh, keeping the crossing points, you know, shut down, you know, for the, for the delivery of the humanitarian aid. He's responsible. They've been like so blatant about this. Like they make the Nazis look like the they hid the fuck out of everything. I mean, the Nazis didn't hide everything, but the Nazis like knew they had like the self awareness that you might want to like yeah. hide the Holocaust. Yeah, and like <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, unless they tried to hide their crime, you know. But the Zionists don't. The Zionists literally like didn't even turn around to their soldiers and be like, "Yo, you want to keep a tight nip on all this?" No, the soldiers were posting to TikTok and like shit, and no one that was like, "No, the the the, 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 the Israel never stopped the soldiers from doing that." Like they yeah. were like, "No, that's fine." Until it started to bite them in the ass, and they were like, "Oh, we need to turn shit." But it was like that was just completely fine to them, and it happened for months and months and months and months, and it still happens. So they haven't really stopped the situation because every time they say, oh, no, our soldiers, have, we've sorted stuff out, everything's going to turn it. There'll be another TikTok video from one of the soldiers doing a fucking war crime. And it's just like, uh, like you, the, 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 the level of incompetence, I don't know whether to fucking thank them or just be completely baffled and confused. Like, because what they do is they show themselves for what they are so much to the world that like everyone's turned against them in a lot of ways. They've still yes. got a lot of supporters, unfortunately, but like when you look at yeah. the mass of like poorer people, they don't want shit with fucking Israel. Israel can fuck off, especially yeah. this eight billion fucking pounds like um, arms deal that was set up by the Tories that oh, is a bill yeah. that's inactive process that could that will be voted on and like labor needs to pull in rank on their party to stop it from being voted on but they won't really? because it's four billion for israel i think and then four billion for ukraine it, it might be it might not be an even split it might be more for israel and less for ukraine or the other way around you would mm. think it'd be the other way around because mm. that would be the practical sense but this is the mm. british and israel practicality yeah. went out the window as soon as you considered britain or like fucking country mm. or whatever the mm. fuck it thinks it mm -hmm. is um like <laughs> well next uh you know the icj decision is going to go back to the uh, u.n general assembly because it was the u.n that asked for the decision in the first place so the u.n was in effect asking for legal authorization to come down with some measures that would be contested as being illegal by the zionist state so what is it they're going to do the pa if they play it you know like if the diplomats Never mind Abbas, you know, like he's, he doesn't do anything. But the diplomats, if they want, you know, they could get enough support now internationally that they can get UN peacekeeping troops to come into the West Bank there and Gaza and push the Zionist troops back and out. That's a possibility. I can see that happening within the next year or two. Uh, but, you know, like... Not so Great Britain, the UN they would have to... Troops don't get used as a means to, like... Basically yeah, it depends who the troops um, are. Yeah, it depends, you know, like, because in Ireland, the uh, British troops that were called in to keep the peace turned out to be, you know, an occupation force. And I remember uh, the woman militant saying that she regretted having ever called, you know, for British uh, peacekeeping troops to be brought in the first place. Yeah, why the fuck would you think the British would ever do peacekeeping? It's not yeah. in, like the... I every time I hear the word British, I like fucking just think fucking warmongers. I don't know, like yeah. you would think like there might be I don't know a country that has like a long history that would propound a knowledge that would perplex that, and you know, uh, but mm. Maggie Thatcher, she got the SAS to fucking start that fucking all trouble uh -huh. like the slaughter of civilians she sent the sas in to do that as well
Uh-huh. And she gave those SAS men medals. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay, so that rules out the British uh, troops as a UN peacekeeping force. What the PA well, would go the for thing would is, be in is the UN. So the UN does have their own specific things that's pulled from troops from different countries. But yeah, this is the like thing. in uh, on the border with Syria and on the border with Lebanon, there's UN peacekeeping troops there right now. Yeah, but they're pulled from different countries. You never that's know right. who's going to push influence on them. I, I think that they should be like, I think that it's not necessarily a bad option. I just worry for what happens after the the Zionists are kicked out, like the, these UN peacekeeping troops then disarm the Palestinian people. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if no, so, it's a, very hard to, to get weapons that. into Palestine. Yeah. So, like, Palestinians really, like, if the peacekeeping troops are going to be the way forward, bury your guns. Yes. But uh, the thing is, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, like, totally in support of that, you know, or I support it with conditions or I don't. Depends on the circumstances because if there's conditions you know, Hamas, that prevent them from causing problems to the Palestinians, like then it would be a tolerable option, but it's not really the best. Yeah, it's very difficult, very dangerous, you know, like a uh, thing to get into, you know. And Hamas has already said that they wouldn't even accept even Arabic forces as UN peacekeeping troops in Gaza to, to keep the Zionist military out. I mean, this the you know, thing who would is be that the, the they, force. they didn't give them an option of like what country they would like to be the peacekeeping force. Mm. They basically just turned around and said an Arab coalition, which almost always is going to be the chauvinists and all that. And you know what, like (laughs) being, even if it was like fucking, um, even if it was, let's say Syria, what the fuck has Syria done in opposing Israel throughout all of this? Yeah. Like, so like even like Syria is not necessarily like the most trustworthy country for them right now. Whoa. Um, yeah, men Let's would probably be their choice, but, but they wouldn't like that. <laughs> like, Who would you it, label it's one of those situations, it's Iran guy. as well. Like, Iran like only re- retaliated to Israel, showing yeah. that it had the might to actually strike Israel when yeah. it was hit, and then won't yeah. actually just like fucking strike them to fucking uh, and start a war. Like, well, they go fight Israel. Like, why not? Like, fucking stand up for the Palestinian people. It's like, possible. You, it's possible. The US happen. literally said they would not get involved because they yeah. don't want to get involved in the war in the region because they know it'll start a world war. In in so, Lebanon like, and in Iran, they told uh, Israel both times that they weren't going to get involved in attacking either of yeah. those countries. Yeah. You know, yeah, they said if you want to go to war with them, you're on your own. Yeah. And advise them strongly against engaging in a conflict with them. Okay, but what Arabic countries would, would be trusted? The only one I can think of, you know, is Algeria. You know, that's Yemen. About... Well, the, yeah, oh, the yeah, yeah, Yemen, yeah. But you know, like the, you know, Yemen has declared, you know, open, Israel's declared open war in Yemen now. You know, like okay, so who the UN could um, pick? Uh, you know, like is, is you know there is no pick. You know, because Algeria, you know, would be the only one to trust that the Palestinians could trust. Uh, we lost all the, we lost all the fucking the the solid like uh, fucking like countries of struggle from back in the day, like. They weren't yeah. as solid as they could have right. been, but like, you know, for all my criticisms of Abdul Nasser, that motherfucker would have invaded Israel before yeah. the end of October. Like uh-huh. that motherfucker would not have let Palestine take Israel on yeah. on their own. Even Sadat, you know, like uh, uh Egypt is a really I nice wouldn't trust that uh, little fucking slimy shit. He's a US asset. Yeah, he went to speak at the Israel Knesset, you know, in support of Zionism. Basically, really. Okay, I think yeah, I need like everything, here. everything went downhill. Like uh, then, now you have like whatever the fuck Egypt is being ran by today with CC. Like that guy is an absolute cretin. Like fucking, you know what he has essentially done is just displayed to the Palestinian people that Egypt is more in favor of Israel over Palestine and chooses its geopolitical ambitions over pan-Arabism. It is the stark opposite of what was pushed by um, Nasser in that regards. Yes, two things. Egypt has put its forces on the border there with Gaza in order to prevent any Palestinians from getting into Egypt, even in the Sinai. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which many Palestinians would want to do, even though it's against the interests of the Palestinians to do so, to, you know, to leave the country, to leave Palestine. Okay. Two, 
they didn't stop the Zionist military from taking over the Rafa crossing. Now, it's the Zionists control both sides of the Rafa crossing, and they won't let any trucks in. You know, like, can't Egypt do something about that? Really? You know, like, whenever I get uh, calls from Palestinians, you know, for aid, and I get calls from Palestinians every day, I tell them, look, you know, like I'm helping Palestine. I can't help individual Palestinians. And what individual Palestinians must do is, is help themselves by going and taking the trucks and bringing them in to uh, Gaza, you know, just physically going there and getting the stuff from the trucks, you know, and not letting anybody stop them from doing so, no matter what. And they can do that. But, oh, yes. I wanted to finish one thought, you know, in terms of, you know, the Zionist argument that there's no provocation for October the 7th, you know, it's like 9-11 or something like that. As if 9-11 wasn't provoked. But, you know, like, what they don't consider to be a provocation is the assassination of all of those 364 civilians, unarmed, peaceful civilians who came on the Great March of Return from Gaza to the frontier and who wanted to go back you know, to the villages from which their grandparents had been expelled from in the first place. That's all. And they would have ended up, you know, living side by side with the Israelis. You know, they didn't have any guns. You know, that's all they wanted to do. And they were shot down, 364. Okay. That I consider to be a provocation. No matter what any Zionists may think, you know, that's irrelevant. That was a provocation for October the 7th. Because if a peaceful march doesn't work, obviously armed resistance is necessary. And the strategy of taking hostages is actually peaceful because, you know, the hostages don't get killed unless they're killed by the Zionist bombardments. So I think Hamas has a, a certain amount of uh, political legitimacy there. But the individual uh, Hamas uh, fighters, when they weren't under, you know, immediate directives, didn't know what to do. You know, I saw a video, one of their body camps, showing them, you know, in a kibbutz village after they had captured it, taken the hostages away. And they were there and they were left. You know, they didn't know what to do. They didn't sit down in a council, you know, to decide, you know, what else they could do. Because it was all presumed that they were going to be wiped out, you know, like within the, you know, first hours of the assault. But instead, it was, you know, 365 military of the uh, Gaza Brigade that were wiped out. Ironically and justifiably, mm -hmm. the equivalent, you know, to the number of civilians who were killed at the, during the Great March of Return. All of the soldiers around the Gaza, all of the military units were wiped out. Then at the, uh, the festival... 57 guards and 10 sec and 20 security guards, you know, were wiped out as well. I mean, border police, 57 border police and 20 security guards. That was an incredible, you know, like a military victory. But some individuals, you know, when they met up, you know, with the festival, you know, they had all these potential hostages there. They didn't collect them, you know, they didn't have any way of taking them back to Gaza. So they started shooting into the crowd. Now, that was crazy. You know, that was, oh, well, what's it? There was um, something I remember being told about how there was um, some uh, non affiliated, so people that aren't in the Intifada. There was these, um, oh, was yeah, the looters. Like one or two other Islamist groups that snuck in um, after they had like breached into that settlement on uh, like October the 7th and they got well, involved I, and they also I, I started shooting I, civilians. I wouldn't put it that way, you know. It wasn't Islamic groups, you know, because Islamic groups were disciplined and and armed. And no, resisted. no, no. There's, there no, uh, no. I mean, like, there's it's a fundamentalist group. That there, uh, there are plenty of Islamist fundamentalist groups that aren't disciplined, and because I'm talking, I'm talking about people that aren't in the Intifada. Okay. Well, the civilians. Yeah, like, I mean, over... if you ain't in the Intifada, you ain't on the right side of things right now, and like this, you know. So, like, these people were opportunists that were taking advantage of the. Um, yeah. They, they they came in through the open fence afterwards, civilians, the rest of the civilians. They had no arms, but they had motorcycles. And I saw they came in, they took a hostage of this woman, you know, was freaking out. And they were taking her back into Gaza. She wasn't raped, but she was taken as a hostage by civilians. So, you know, I, like, I was and not of course about they them. went in there I'm to loot as well. That, like, no, I'm saying that, like, so that from the situation that happened, I'm saying there were also people not associated with the Intifada called Islamic, that were a part of Islamic fundamentalist militant groups that oh. took advantage of Hamas's uh, hostage capture to go in with assault rifles and cause trouble themselves. Uh -huh, I haven't heard about this. That's, that's possible. I, that's what I was told. And basically it's suggesting that like, actually like 
the idea that Hamas opened fire to any civilians is like highly unlikely. Um, like well, other than Hamas, when they uh, came video in that on I the, saw when they were at the festival, you know, they were in their Jeep, you know, the white Jeep and uh, they're packed into the back there. And this guy stands up and starts shooting, you know, just arbitrarily, you know, this one guy. So, I mean, that is, you know, like individual criminal activity. So that guy should be charged. But I don't think that it's a reflection on Hamas strategy at all. No, no, there's a guy getting like being a fucking dipshit. But yeah. yeah, what's it? Um, but that situation, the point I'm getting at is that so there's like a couple of people that maybe caused some trouble, yeah, because like, there was a small number of people that um that this situation occurred from, like, and then you have Israel, which comes in with helicopters and yeah. shoots the entire crowd, yeah. That's the thing. They don't. They don't word it that way. They just say mm. that like about eleven hundred people died, mm. and they say that. Yeah. And there's some studies that say Israel may have killed somewhere between like 80 percent of the people that day, and that might be a low ball. But even if it is a low ball, mm. that's a lot of fucking people. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen proof of seventy cars, you know, loaded cars with people. Uh, having been wiped out, you know, by Hellfire missiles, you know, launched by the Apache helicopters. Yeah. Yeah, that's happened. And you know, probably Israel killed more Israelis than Hamas did, who were civilians, never mind the soldiers. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, but true, you know, the young people tripping on ecstasy at the uh, festival were probably soldiers themselves. They just didn't have their guns with them. They thought that everything was fine and dandy, you know, it was a holiday. And they go to, you know, like have fun. And then and, and 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 do a festival right on the border with Gaza that's starving, you know, like these people were not conscious of what they were placing themselves right next to a military base. On the road, on the way to a military base from Gaza, they placed this concert. Incredible. You know, the lack of consciousness, the delusion, delusion uh of grandeur. That the concert to have celebrate been the with. A, a concert to celebrate seventy five years of occupation as well of that. Yeah, it's the seventy fifth yeah. year. Yeah, that's a big thing, you know, for them, and that's what another reason why Hamas attacked this year. That's why I put my slogan on the seventy five anniversary Israel parade poster at the Jewish Community Campus when I went out of, came out of a Holocaust meeting. You know, yeah. that's for and that's why you know I got charged with criminal uh, mischief by the hate crimes division of the Montreal uh, police. And, uh, you know, like, and a free Palestine. Okay, you know, like, that's all. Yeah, that's gonna go to trial. Well, that's, have a that's, lot that's, of fun that's, there that's in court. Scary, that's scary words for, uh, for Israel. Oh yeah, you know, that can't be, you know, like there's only Israel. And uh, it's the 75th anniversary, and it's there permanently, you know, forever and ever. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if you've got to call your country is real, um, like <laughs> you're not confident about your existence. <laughs> oh, they don't even know what Israel means, you know. Like uh, some of the Zionists that came um, up to me at the vigil, and they started you know chanting, uh, 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 you know, the slogan, uh, Am Yisrael Chai. Long live Israel. Okay, Am Yisrael Chai. Uh, Am Yisrael Chai. Chai means li lives. Israel is Israel. Am is uh, is supposed to be like the soul of Israel, or the nation, or the people of Israel, or and now the Zionists have transformed it into saying it means the state of Israel. Am Yisrael Chai. They don't even know what they're saying. You know, like Am doesn't mean state. You know, the, well, the Hebrew mean, name for a state is Medina. Medina, yeah. you know. And 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 so, you know, they're shouting this at me as if, you know, it's a slogan, you know, supporting Israel. So I shout, you know, I sing back to them in Hebrew chanting because I did my bar mitzvah. And, you know, I, I, I chant, I'm Yisrael Chai, okay. La Medinat Velo Yisrael. You know, the state is not Israel just to make it clear that um doesn't mean the state, you know? And then they start, that forces them to think, you know? So, but the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, they don't know how to answer the Zionists in any such way. They are totally lost. All they can do is shout, and it's useless. They're getting nowhere. And this pillar of support that 
that the Zionist state enjoys, you know, from Jewish communities internationally, including Melbourne, you know, like has a big support. Even the Jewish Bund in Melbourne will not criticize Zionism. The Jewish Bund is incapable because they're so afraid of the Zionist power there. Incredible. Motherfuckers, that's a, that's a situation and a half. They need to yeah. really get their shit together on that one because you've got to yeah. challenge these things. You've got to make a stand, otherwise no one's going to make a stand. And even the headquarters of the Jewish Bund in Paris at the Maidem Center, you know, they came out with a, a position in support of the Zionist state, you know, after October the 7th. And so I wrote him, I'm um, telling you, you've abandoned Bundism, you know, you have no right to speak in the name of Bundism anymore, you know, like that's not Bundist. I mean, if we think even further back with this trial, though, like um, the, the word, the name, you know, yeah. uh -huh. I don't think they really seem to know who they named their state after and why his name is significant to the existence of the soon to become Jewish peoples from the Hebrew peoples, you know, like the uh, Israel has um, like an old school meaning to it that, Oh, might just mean the word struggle. Oh, there might just be an Arabic word. That's a bit, you know, means the same thing. You know, uh, you might, you might recognize that, um, that now, now Israelis don't get scared when I say jihad. <laughs> <laughs> so they name their country after what's going to destroy them. You know, at least they put the fucking right information on the tin. Manufacturers just don't do that anymore these days. So, you, you know, you got to like at least give them credit there. They put the right, they put the right information on the tin. Struggle is going to destroy israel like you know and that's the thing they so what i'm in as well is they name themselves after jacob basically jacob fought with an yes. angel for what they say is like two days but they don't say whether it's sunrise to sunset two days or whether it's like just kind of sort of two days who knows like it, it's it's i it i find mean, it yeah, funny it if it's just struggle, like specifically yes. yeah, specifically from the first second of like <laughs> The one day and then the last second of the other day he wins. But through yeah. the struggle with this um angel, um Jacob goes from being like um uh what's it uh the use he's known as like the usurper of God and all sorts of like um things. He's also known as the follower of God. He has a weird like weird what I've history. heard. But um Kara, he then became that, Israel. Uh, yeah, what I've heard is that uh Okay, so it symbolizes, the name Israel symbolizes his struggle with the angel, okay. But there is another term in Hebrew, I don't know if it's Old Hebrew or New Hebrew, which means uh, 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 jihad, and that is milchuma mitzvah, which means holy war, literally oh. speaking. Yes, this is not known, this is only internal, you know, what the Zionists use themselves. And when they mean by that, you know, is what Galant is talking about, you know, he's talking about a holy war there. Yeah, no, okay. they've been preaching holy war for ages. Actually, that guitar song I played to you the other week, that was uh, a song called Holy Wars, <laughs> full <laughs> circle. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the name Israel comes from an old Canaanite name for the deity, El. El is an old Canaanite name of the, of the god. Okay. Yeah. And it's used again in Judaism to give, you know, this name. And usually, you know, the, the part before, you know, the name of God usually means a servant of or friend of God. Okay. Ah, same, so that's where we where Jacob's Latin name meaning comes from. Yeah. Now, the same thing is used, the same method of, you know, of naming things is used by the Canaanites for Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem was named by not the Hebrews. No. It was named by the, the Jebusites. Oh, the Jebusites. Oh, okay. Jebusites. And Jebusites, you know, turned into Je Je Jeru, which, you know, like is a, 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 a preposition, I suppose. Yeah, because if Solomon, I remember rightly, originally it's pronounced Jerusalem, not, not uh, you know, there's no like just sound to the start of it. It actually has a sort of more like um, you know, sound. It's like kind of blend. Um, uh -huh. pronounce, yeah, it's, if it emphasizes yeah. Salem at the end more so, then that would be very correct because Salem was the Canaanite name for another, you know, the Jebusite name for, yeah. for the deity. Okay. You know, like, and then the Zionists claim that, you know, they founded Jerusalem. Then how come David conquered 
Jerusalem and occupy Jerusalem if Jerusalem didn't exist before he conquered it. It could not have existed if it was not you know, conquered. <laughs> you know, the, the logic that they used, you know, like, is so arbitrary, you know, like. I mean, it's know. like, fuck, it, like, the, the, the fact that we have, we know of the history that goes really far back in this place that might, I don't know, have some things that are like so old that they exist during a time where there was not just like Hebrews there because when the 12 tribes of Israel were in the region, they were the like foreigners, like they were like the newbies that come over and, um, yeah. you know, like there, there was all sorts of trouble that happened. Um, Solomon. Um, <laughs> And the reason why they were dispersed so, you know, into the 12 different regions is because they weren't concentrated into one region because every region was populated already. So they just, yeah. you know, dispersed out, you know, to be a minority nationality amongst the others, you know, because it was permitted. And also it made things easier, you know, because there was more land available, you know, for people to live on. So, you know, there was no state at the time. There was no nation state at the time. You know, nation no, meant people... It wasn't until Solomon decided to make the kingdom of Israel and that thing crashed and burned in 80 years' time. Yes, yes. The Samaritans explain that very well. They have it in their museum uh, up at the Mount Gerizim on the side of Nablus there. Trying to make it, sure the Israelis don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, like, Samuel denounced, you know, the monarchy, you know, and the state building that that the populist uh, masses wanted to have. And he said, the Jewish people are not a nation like other nations. And then the populace said, we want to be a nation like other nations, you know, like, oh, okay, fuck you. You know, like take that kid over there to be your king. If you want to have a king, that was Samuel. And then he got carried away with himself. And so did David. And Solomon sort of, you know, cooled things down a while until it all cracked up because another king wanted to tax people for what, for what Samuel says was war, you know, why do you want to have war? You know, like, forget it. King means war. That's it. That's how. The state is this, is a state of war. That's what is the reason for a state existence, is to be prepared for war and to wage war. That's all the state is. And everything else, you know, can go to, can go to hell, you know, including the uh, NHS. <laughs> They're privatizing that. You know, that's like on the chopping board. Uh, yeah, um, the same thing here in Canada. You know, I've had to wait years to get my uh, surgical operations. And finally, now I'm getting it. But, you know, not enough care. You know, after getting my knee uh, opened up and uh, cut off and replaced by a, a, a cadmium chrome alloy, sitting on a cushion of hard plastic, which is embedded into a layer of titanium, which is covering a stainless steel uh, pike fitted into my lower uh, leg bone. Okay. A day after that having happened, you know, I get kicked out of the hospital. You, know, you can walk home. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so that's what, you know, the healthcare th provides for here in Canada. You know, yeah, you just is... left the fuck off. Like that's how yeah. they do it. Yeah, a... yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like, and then you can pay for your own taxi home as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so your own taxi home and no hospitals are local anymore. No, no. So Physiotherapists can't. 50, Fifty pounds on a fucking taxi because the hospitals and fucking fuck, 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 no. Yeah. About that, 50 pounds. That's what I had to pay. Yeah, to get home. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, we know that the whole sort of, you know, thing is uh, in crisis. We know that they're trying to cope with the crisis by offering solutions that are not solutions in the Labour Party. And we know that we're disunited and we don't have any countervailing force yet. And we know that we have to build up a united front to contest the powers that be and to defend ourselves, especially in the United States of America, which is now going to be taken over by a gang of terrorists that call themselves Christians. Did you hear Trump talking about the one country and the one faith? 
that he stands forth. One faith. Now, the way he said the word faith, one faith, you know, he sort of whispered it. You know, like, <laughs> guys, just <laughs> like, it, it wouldn't surprise me if he's an atheist and the guy's just like pretending <laughs> to be a Christian all of a sudden. Of course. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Oh, God. He's a yeah. uh, crafty pathetic. little shit. Like, people need crafty to and that. pathetic, yeah. Untalented. Crafty, pathetic, but also, like, the reason he's, like, so fucking, like, um, capable of that kind of stuff is because mm -hmm. of how much of a narcissist he is. He's constantly yeah. constructing rhythms around this kind of stuff. Yeah. He, he's, he's so American, you know. The Americans love him because he's so American. And they cannot he think looks of... American, like every, like all the Americans are like, like in the like the news media and all that are ripping him on his hair, and I'm like, it, it looks like how Americans look. This is American yeah. businessman, like yeah, stock yeah. photo four. Yeah, yeah, chubby as hell and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. The like the 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 swoop over the top with the straight at the back, and then oh yeah, that's the that's chic, you know. <laughs> yeah, chic chicness. Yeah, bourgeois chic. That's his style. Yeah. Jersey slash New York capitalist. Yeah. Uh, pathetic. And we have to live right next door to that thing. Canada is so overwhelmed by all the power. You know, like all of all of industry in the country is taken over by the United States. And the banks, the only thing left of the Canadian economy are the banks, which are inter- uh, locked by interlocking directorships with American corporations in Canada. So the banks are serving American corporations in Canada, basically. Now, you know, like the depth to which, you know, American corporate control extends into Canada is something that I used to teach, you know, as uh, I did a political economy of Canada-U.S. relations at York University in 1978. And, uh, there is no, you know, like significant, you know, Canadian industry. You know, there used to be, you know, something called Canadian Arm on the uh, uh, sp uh, on the space station, and uh, that was uh, bought out by an American firm as well. Even though they seem to have stayed in Montreal, but nonetheless, it's not a Canadian anymore. But that was the only thing, you know, like uh, recently, you know, of Canadian significance was the Canada Arm with a little Canada flag on it sticking there that American television tried to avoid at all costs because they called it the American arm. <laughs> Robot I mean, arm. Fucking can you know, what's it? Canada is its own little America in its own ways anyway. So like, it's kind of like potato, potato between the two of them. They're kind of fighting over like, who's the fucking like, um, who's the biggest shit in like a lot of regards. Um, was it uh the way the Canadian armed fucking mountain police all of a sudden go from looking like some some action like fucking police officer? <laughs> they look like that a lot of the time when you see them, but then when you see them, sometimes if you might be of native descent, they'll be dressed in military uniform with fucking assault rifles, yeah. like Canada. Like Canada has this like veneer of like um. Hmm. Uh, you know, oakley dokeliness where hmm. like uh, every everything is everything is a okay. You know, you will just chop lumber for sixteen hours a day and then then, then sleep for four hours and yeah, um, yeah. Well, the the confrontation you referred to, I think, it occurred at the Kanasatake called Oka in English, and uh, there, you know, the uh, some golf course was trying to take over a, an indigenous cemetery to expand its uh, reach. And so they, uh, uh, the uh, Mohawk warriors, they occupied it and they wouldn't let you know anybody in there. And they sent the military and then the military assaulted them and they started shooting and they shot one of their own. And when they found, you know, that it was, you know, a Canada military bullet that had killed one of their own military, that's the only time that they backed off, you know, because they totally blew their credibility. And uh, um, because they were trying to pretend that it was the Mohawk warriors that were terrorists instead of them. And so they they proved the opposite. And then they had to withdraw and they won. I thought this situation was involving a pipeline, but it might be that one. That was out west. Yeah, that's another thing. You know, they wouldn't allow a pipeline over the Dakota territory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, That's uh, another struggle. It's so, um, the constants of like genocide going on around the world where people just kind of seem to like, you know, they look at like October the 7th and all of a sudden now the conversation is Palestinian genocide, but Palestinian genocide has been going on for like continuously since Israel would come to exist. Yeah. People need to finally not just say Israel needs to end its apartheid. Israel is the apartheid. Israel mm -hmm. needs to end. Yes. So one way in which we can do that is, um, as in the uh, Spanish Civil War, we were asking for volunteers to come into Palestine at the Tanweer Forum in Nablus, West Bank, Palestine, where the uh, popular resistance committees are organizing many actions to go and protect villages' lands, the Jordan River Valley as well, uh, with uh, together with international volunteers from Europe mainly, but uh, we certainly need, you know, North Americans as well, because why? They won't shoot live bullets, you know, into a crowd, you know, it includes, you know, some some uh, Europeans, Westerners, because that would give them bad a bad name. Mm -hmm. So they don't shoot live bullets; they just shoot the rubber bullets. In fact, I got hit by one, and I was just examining it the other day, and the skin is healed pretty well, but underneath it. The bone has a little sort of, you know, crater in it. <laughs> so, you know, like no fooling around. Yeah, they they got steel balls inside of them. Makes them fucking hit like a motherfucker. They hurt real bad. Here is one. This is it. Huh? It's pretty big, huh? Yeah, it is a pretty chunky motherfucker. As big as the thumb. Yeah. And it's pretty heavy. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, no, they, they so we need volunteers. Up, they we need volunteers to come there and do video work, to do commentaries, and to be able to go back and uh, testify as to what they saw while they were in Palestine. That's the work of a volunteer. In place of you know UN peacekeeping force, we have to make our own peacekeeping force. <laughs> we should we should do T-shirts, you know, like with uh, volunteer peacekeeping force, you know, like. And put a that UN logo dope, on it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like uh, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that would be sick. Or maybe even like for the winter, get some like jackets or something. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and body armor. <laughs> oh, fuck. You're going to need that with the way the Israelis, you know, need, especially yeah. stuff for the head. They like to do, they like to do the whole snipe and stuff. So they will. Yes. And then they go for the limbs to, uh, incapacitate people so they wouldn't be able to make it back. But the one guy, you know, had both of his legs, you know, taken off. He came back in a wheelchair with a slingshot, you know, like a, a David sling in his wheelchair holding a Palestinian flag. And I've got the picture of it, you know, it should be a statue. And then he was eventually killed, of course, but, you know, that's the way it goes. He's still but resisting. what a fucking like absolute like legend for just like man that may not given up the fight you cannot stop this motherfucker like he is like yeah he, he is like taken out like lost his legs and that motherfucker is still he knows he ain't gonna win but he wants to die fighting and like that's a that's fucking a, like yeah, victory thing. in I itself you know? yeah, so yeah, yeah, much yeah, yeah. Yeah, just like Ireland, you know, like Ireland endured and finally got, liberated itself partially, externally, even if not uh, internally. I mean, I mean, how much have they really liberated themselves? The fucking Irish Free State are like little bitches of the British, basically. You know, so who, to the point that Britain has wanted to give the Northern Ireland uh, Irish counties to them three times, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, the Irish Republic isn't stupid. They know that that's a fucking ticking time bomb if the, uh, with, with the potato. Ulster loyalists and the Ulster yeah, nationalists yeah, yeah. just to have it like given to them like a hot potato. And so they've just declined every time. Um, uh, yeah. So, so who's there to do the, to finish the job? You know, who's there to finish the revolution? You know, what formation is there? Well, there there's a lot of different groups going on right now. There's like, um, when it comes to like principal groups, AI, AI tends to be on the top of most people's list. That's anti-imperialist uh, action, Ireland. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, what about political parties? Are there any sort of, you know, revolutionaries? Uh, 
There used to be well, an IRA. Why, I understand AI, there used to be an IRA, like you know, a, like, are they still around? No. Ah, uh, like, the provosts are just a bunch of bouncers these days. Yeah. They, they just go around acting like fucking, uh, like, debt collectors for drug lords and shit, <laughs> causing trouble. Bodyguards. There was, there was one guy, you know, who was who sounded, you know, radical. He used to speak up all the time. Adams with Finch. Oh, was Jerry it? fucking Adams. He's a cunt. Yeah? What is yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He's the guy who signed the Good Friday Agreement that fucking crippled our ability to arm ourselves and, like, uh, basically signed away the struggle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He, he, uh, the, a lot of the provosts got really pissed off with the way he basically just threw them all under the bus. And so there was a provost split after the Good Friday Agreement uh, uh-huh. with the people who were against it, wanting to continue the... The long, the long war. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. End of the day, like the whole point of the long war was, it's meant to be a liberation war. Both the provosts and the um, the communists were all preaching this, and mm-hmm. um, with the provosts, they ended up having to come into a situation where. Um, the party that was representing them. And a good chunk of the organization itself didn't treat it as a war of liberation anymore and just wanted to end it altogether with the British based on a treaty. Mm-hmm. Now that's not a that's not a ceasefire. That's not a, a call for the end of hostilities. That's a treaty. Now, goddamn, anyone who's Irish who has doesn't maybe you don't even know about this treaty. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, know about treaties with Ireland. They don't go well. We've had a few. We've, uh, you know, the one in 22 isn't the only one. There was also like the Anglo Irish Treaty that was before it. And there's a few uh-huh. others even earlier uh-huh. than that. Like it, it's not the first time the British have made some treaties regarding Ireland, and every one of them is cursed, awful, and terrible. And so is this one. Because uh-huh. rather than just signing a deal to be like, let's end the war, it kind of put a lot of precursors on trying to strip people of their arms mm. you know it, 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 but it did let out a lot of political prisoners and that's like the one thing he's got to keep telling himself that mm. he did a good thing because he got the political prisoners out and it's like that mm. all well and good but yeah. like any actual Irish radical any Irish radical would have declared for like fucking allied political prisoners as well to get out pushing for like Palestinians and other people like that to get kicked out that to get removed out of those prisons you know palestinians um there's palestinian revolutionaries inside like um british prisons in northern ireland that have been there for decades Uh Uh oh okay there's a lot of other different groups that's difficult yeah what about scotland what are the prospects for uh, scotland to 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 drift um chaos Chaos is follow the, the British, I guess, while telling everyone that they're not the British. Uh, they they promise. It depends on like as well, like what 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 kind of part of Scotland we're talking about. Because with the Scots, I don't know where the fuck they're going. Like, uh-huh, like okay. I I don't for something more revolutionary, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's just gonna be like either increased labor support or um, let's say fucking um like support for like one of the more social democratic or revisionist organizations cropping up in those regions. Like there isn't really like with, with the Germanics, like they might be acting all like that they've got some fucking liberation thing going on with like forming their own like thing, but they're just trying to do empire. Like mm-hmm. not really all much of a liberation if you want to just be the British, which was like a concept created by the Scottish. I, 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 I don't know. It feels like we're going full circle. Uh, like is it the 1640s again? But um, what's it? The um, situation that uh, the Scots Gaelic find themselves in is that like Republican socialism seems to be in disarray and not very well organized, and so mm-hmm. there needs to be greater concrete organizing around Republican socialism in the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's okay. like sort of the big situation there, because that's the problem with Scotland. Is like it's. Not exactly just like simply an nation. It's like um, 
it's got like two different like major ethnic groups in there that differ quite vastly from each other. Uh huh. Uh huh. Celts Well, it would and be the interesting Germans. to see Scotland becoming independent, you know, because then they would have the offshore rights, you know, to the North Sea gas fields and oil fields. Then England would have nothing, nothing but the banks. Well, okay. No, I wouldn't put it past Britain to just like override that like secession. Yeah, they would try to keep the oil fields for sure. Uh, well, I just mean then override Scotland secession. Override I mean, secession, they override yes, it, as well. They override they could it. Do that. They overrided the uh, the gender bill when they did the uh, the the gender age act in Scotland for like being able to access like transaffirmative healthcare. Um, the uh, the British government shut it down. Rishi Sunak. Wow. Okay, that's trouble. Okay, so we can look forward this week, this coming week, to the uh, International C Criminal Court is going to come down with some indictments against Netanyahu and company. But Lamy has already said, you know, that if Netanyahu came to England, Swingland, that he would ignore the warrant issued by the International Criminal Court and not arrest Netanyahu, evidently. So that's that for the International Criminal Court. There's got to be some other way to deal with it. Okay, so we'll see what's going to happen now. The, the ICJ proves useless again. Proves useless again. But the ICJ decision and, and verdict is going back to the General Assembly. And the General Assembly is basically the revolting third world now, led by China and Russia. And... In addition to China and Russia, Iran's coming into play now as well. So let's see what they can do. Okay. But otherwise, their own interest. it has to uh, has to come from Palestinian resistance itself. Otherwise, the whole, the whole thing is lost. And that's the most important. So that's why we need volunteers coming to Palestine to help out the Palestinians. And I'll be going back there myself as, at the end of the year. Okay. So we can conclude on that basis. We know what we're going to be doing. And so we just need to go and do it. That's all. That's it. That's all, right? Yeah, I mean, what's uh, I would say that realistically, the world radical revolutionary struggle is led by the Intifada, not by two imperialists and one regional imperialist. But otherwise, yeah. yeah. No, it comes from the Palestinians, you know. The whole world is following the Palestinians in Gaza. <laughs> Basically, Palestinians in Gaza are leading a world revolution. And it's been lasting for quite a while. And the outcome is uh, is uh, undetermined. The whole thing is open-ended. Very sort of unusual. Never like this before. Israel, Israel tries to feel like that they have like a conclusive like victory. They, they, that's why they yeah. keep rushing for more and more devastation. Like that's why they don't care about like all mm. the lies that you know that they're telling, that telling the Americans. Oh yeah, no, we'll agree to a ceasefire, and then just like still going at it and slaughtering villages, like in the uh, refugee camps, and uh, um, what's it? So like they're rushing for victory. They think that they have like managed to conquer the Palestinian people entirely. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see about that. I mean, they're getting pretty desperate. They're so desperate that they want to conscript the uh, the uh, ultra orthodox and pull them out of the yeshiva, yeah. get them into a, <laughs> and give them a gun. Well, if they give them a gun, they'll probably get shot. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, they they know that like the world is coming at them, so that's what I'm saying is that they're trying to rush for it. They've got a bloodlust. They've gotten so many people killed already. 40,000 people in like eight, nine months is like a pretty fucking quick ratio to kill with just bombs and guns. At least like, 40,000, you know, with uh, various factors which can uh, double or triple it as well. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Hard times. We'll keep on going. And uh, 
what we're doing is essential, very essential. Okay, bye for now. Here's my big fist. <laughs>